Okay, let's uh, get started. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, we're talking about uh, start building distributed applications using building block APIs, uh, using, using Dapper. Uh, I, I hope you, you realize that. Um, my name is Mark Duiker. I'm a senior advocate, uh, developer advocate at Diagrid. That's a company uh, founded in the US by the uh, yeah, co-creators of Dapper Open Source, Mark Fossil and Jeroen Snyder. Um, they got together, I think, about two years ago and they founded Diagrid and we now build some commercial, commercial products in the Dapper ecosystem. Um, I'm also a Dapper community manager and uh, once every two weeks we host a uh, Dapper community call where we invite Dapper end users to yeah, share their experience about, about Dapper uh, and also um, have like contributors and maintainers uh, speak about new Dapper features. Um, I consider myself like a long time developer community supporter. I've been organizing like uh, meetups and then uh, other developer events. Uh, so if I can help you with something, if you want to uh, be more active in developer communities, uh, feel free to, to ping me and I'd, I'd like to help out. Um, if you want to know more about my creative side, I do a lot of uh, pixel uh, art. I make some music with my modular synthesizer. I do some creative coding. Um, all of that information is on my website, uh, markduiker.dev. So feel free to, uh, to check that out. Uh, someone already asked, uh, what, what is VS Code Pets? Because he, he saw this, this panel in, in VS Code. Well, uh, VS Code Pets is one of the areas I contributed to. It's uh, like a bit of a useless um, uh, thing. Uh, you can like uh, throw, throw balls and <laughs> Uh, you have these pets that uh, can actually, well, eventually they will pick up the ball. I'm not sure. It's, it's, not, it's not very fast at the moment. I'm not sure. Um, but you can add all, all kinds of pets in here. So okay, um, I did not contribute all the pets here, but for instance, there's also a pet rock, um, which, which, which doesn't move, obviously, because it's a rock. Uh, but, 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 you can, but you can add it, and there are some, some, some animations there. So just to spice up your, your IDE a bit. All right, but, but you're not here for this, I, I realize. So by, by the, how, many, how many of you are like using VS Code as your daily editor oh quite some people okay and nice. well so you can i think there are like two million installs of vs code pets so um if, if they're like <laughs> so it's it's yeah it's, it's pretty popular even though it's pretty pretty useless but uh, yeah uh, feel free to install it um okay to to get a bit of more context uh, a lot of especially big organizations are uh, creating like distributed applications right they're like uh, microservice architectures uh, and this is just an example of some kind of an e-commerce system right where you have like a checkout service and you have notifications and shopping carts and inventory checks, etc. Lots of different state stores and message brokers, etc. Um, but it's actually quite hard to, to do this like properly, right? Especially if you're just uh, yeah uh, just starting out with this. So there are several challenges that you need to overcome. So how do you deal with like orchestrating business logic across services? Um, how do you deal with like distributed tracing across services, but also across message brokers? Um, how do you deal with like access control? Eh? So which services are allowed to talk to each other and which services are allowed to publish, which ones are, can subscribe, uh, which ones do we allow access to, to state stores? Um, and last but not least, uh, also resiliency, right? So what happens if one of these services is temporarily down or what, 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 what if your uh, state store is temporarily down? All of the things, yeah, you need to think about it. And usually, um, yeah, you build something yourself for these things and it, that all ends up in your own application code. Uh, so, yeah, you get like very bulky services with uh, yeah, a lot of like cross-cutting concerns in there. So if you're in that area, uh, yeah, then Dapper, the distributed application runtime, might be a very useful tool uh, for you to use. Here's a screenshot of the uh, website. It's uh, dapper.io. Um, and it's really... But if you like uh, run your applications um, with Dapper, uh, Dapper is not part of your source code, but Dapper runs in a separate process. It uses the sidecar pattern. Uh, so Dapper runs in a sidecar next to your application in a separate process. And if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you probably heard about sidecars, or maybe you also heard about service meshes. Uh, Dapper is not a service mesh though. Uh, service meshes really operate on, on the network level. Uh, Dapper is really like a, like a developer tool. Uh, and there are some similarities between service meshes, but they are they are distinct and people often use them both. They use and Dapper and something like uh, Istio. Um, but Dapper takes care of all of the heavy lifting, right? So all of the communication between services and also between like services and, and resources like message brokers and state stores, everything goes through the Dapper sidecar. So that's also why Dapper uh, provides a lot of like built-in resiliency and observability because all of the communication flows through uh, these, these sidecar processes. So uh, you don't have to put in all of that logic in your own application code anymore because that's all built into Dapper. 
So uh, besides like the observability and security and resiliency part, uh, Dapper offers like uh, yeah, a whole uh, suite of tools of, of APIs that developers can use. So one of the newer ones is, for instance, Workflow, but we're not talking about Workflow in this, in this session. Um, I will demonstrate uh, some uh, pop-sub API. I will demonstrate service application and state management. It's like a key value uh, state management. Um, but yeah, there are over like uh, like 10 different APIs at, uh, at, at the moment. Uh, sorry, like 12 APIs at the moment. And every year, uh, that, that surface area of APIs is, is also growing. Um, and since Dapper is running in a sidecar, you can basically use any language uh, that, that you want, because uh, in the end, you will need to make an HTTP or GPC call to the Dapper uh, process. There are a couple of client SDKs uh, that make it a bit easier to, uh, to work with Dapper, especially if you're using like, type languages. Um, I'm pretty much a .NET uh, user, so I definitely use the .NET SDK quite, uh, quite often. Um, typically, Dapper uh, applications are run on top of Kubernetes or a managed form of Kubernetes. Uh, so you can just run it on plain Kubernetes or have one of the yeah, major cloud hosts uh, that, uh, that offer Kubernetes services. Uh, I'm just running the demos on my local machine, right? So you can also just run the Dapper process on your laptop or on any uh, VM if you want it. Um, the really nice thing about Dapper is that the, um, the APIs are decoupled from the underlying infrastructure. So, for instance, if you look at the state management API, so that's a key value pair API, but Dapper itself isn't a state store. Yeah? So, Dapper itself is a runtime, it runs in the sidecar, and it has yeah, no, no concept of a real uh, state store um, implementation. But you can configure uh, different state stores to be used with Dapper. And, well, here's just a short list of five different state stores that you can configure to be, to be used, um, but I think there are like 20 or 25 different state stores that you can actually use with, uh, with Dapper. And in total, across all of the APIs, there are over 120 components uh, that you can use like across uh, cloud services and open source solutions. So Dapper is really a very flexible framework uh, that you can use uh, yeah, with any type of uh, pop-up message broker or any type of state store. Uh, just as an example of um, how is a developer uh, can, can use Dapper and using the different APIs. Uh, so here's like an example of three different applications. Application A, uh, which communicates with um, um, via service verification via application B. Um, so you use a, like an, an invoke method there. Um, application A also uses a, the secrets API to retrieve uh, a secret from a secret store. Uh, application B uh, uses the configuration API to, to read uh, configuration from a configuration store. Application A um, then uses the pops up a method to publish a message on a message broker. Application C is subscribed to that same message broker and then uses the state API to persist some state. Uh, and Dapper also has the notion of um, input and output bindings. That's a way to actually yeah, uh, push data out of your system or uh, get data into your system. Um, so what I really like about Dapper is that swappable component model, because in your application, you're using the Dapper API, right? So you're making these HTTP calls or GPC calls or use the client SDKs. Uh, and those are like agnostic of the underlying infrastructure, right? So if I'm using like, I'm using Redis in my example, but I'm not using any Redis specific APIs. I'm using the Dapper uh, state API or, or the PubSub API, which under the hood uses then um, uh, Dapper and, or Redis. Uh, but my application has no notion of the underlying infrastructure. So for instance, if I'm developing uh, this thing like locally uh, and I am uh, reading a, a secret um, a value, then locally I can point my, um, um, uh, I can point to a, like a local file, which is just stored on my hard drive. Uh, make sure it's not checked into Git, of course. Um, and I then use the uh, PubSub API to publish a message and I will locally use like a, a locally running Redis instance. And uh, these applications are then subscribed to uh, the, the same uh, Redis instance there. Uh, and I can use, again, the state management API, which then points to like an in-memory um, uh, state store configuration. So this is why I'm doing local development, but then I can very easily switch to different components without changing my application code. So for instance, if I'm running on Azure, then I can point to Azure Key Vault for my secrets, and I'm using Azure Service Bus as my pops up uh, broker, and I'm using Cosmos DB as my state store. And the only change that is required are different component files. So these are YAML-based uh, files. I will show them later. But no application code will be changed. And the same is true for different cloud providers, right? So we have cloud provider-specific components, but the API that's used in your applications is exactly the same in all these situations. Same for GCP or other models. 
So uh, Dapper will be like five years old next month. It will be actually like an, an online uh, uh, celebration uh, event uh, next month uh, with, with some uh, uh, some keynote speakers like Marco Sinovic and also uh, Joe Bida. Um, so, and yeah, there are a lot of contributors over these five years. We have over like 3,000 contributors over the years. We have quite a very big Discord. So if you want some more information about Dapper or if you're stuck, I can definitely recommend you to go to the, uh, to the Dapper Discord if you, if you need some help. Um, we also have some quite some big names in the Dapper contributor list. Uh, so we have yeah, many, many big corporations who have uh, contributed or are still contributing to Dapper, uh, which is also um, yeah, a great achievement, I think. And a lot of these contributors are also Dapper end users. Uh, so that's also, uh, also good to see. And if you want to read some, some stories, some, uh, some case uh, studies, I've included a link here to the CNCF website. I will share the link of this uh, repo uh, with you soon. Um, so you can read all about these, these case studies of uh, yeah, big companies that, that use, uh, use Dapper. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at some of the APIs. Um, so we'll start with the, with the uh, service invocation uh, API. Um, so service invocation is used uh, to communicate like synchronously, right? L like a request response model. Um, and there are like configurable retry policies. I'll show you that as well. And um, it has like built-in uh, tracing and metrics. You can also uh, configure like access policies to, um, um, to define which services are allowed to communicate with each other. And you can also uh, plug in uh, different middleware components. So as an example, let's say we have a customer service and uh, you want to make a service invocation call to uh, the checkout service to the order endpoint there. Uh, then you can um, use the invoke endpoint. Then you need to um, uh, mention the Dapper application ID of the target service. So every application has like a Dapper unique application ID. Uh, so in this case, that's named uh, checkout. And then you do slash method and then the name of the, uh, of the method that you want to invoke. So this is how you can invoke uh, the order method on the checkout service from the customer service here. Um, so what happens under the hood? Well, your application uses the Dapper API, which is running in the Dapper sidecar. So your application is talking to the Dapper sidecar. That Dapper sidecar will need to do like um, a name resolution uh, to find out what the uh, location is of the checkout service. Uh, so that's, that's happening here. Uh, once the um, address has been found, it will um, make a request to the Dapper sidecar of that application and that Dapper sidecar will then forward that request to the checkout service and then uh, and the response goes the same way through these uh, three sidecars. So you might think, from, okay, there's maybe like a lot of latency involved with all these multiple hops, uh, but that's actually not the case. I think the average latency is around like uh, seven, uh, seven milliseconds. So, uh, so it's not that bad. Uh, the metrics are actually published. So we can, uh, we can we can find it out. Um, here's like a quick sample in, uh, in in JavaScript. So we create an order, and here we see that we use like a slightly different way of uh, of constructing how we are making this uh, service invocation call uh, to the target service. So here we only specify the host name and the port, and then do slash order. So we don't mention the Dapper application ID as part of the URL here. Uh, but instead, when we um, make the call, we specify uh, the the target ID as a header, so we can also do that. So we need to specify the dapper-app-id, and that's another way of um, making a call to uh, another service. Okay, before we start the demo, let's also talk a bit about a state management API. So this is like a key value pair API. Um, so this integrates with many different uh, state stores, like, like I mentioned. Uh, locally, I'll be uh, using like a, a Redis container, uh, but you can configure like many different state stores. Um, depending on the state store, there's also like configurable levels of, of concurrency and consistency. You can also do like bulk operations, like bulk updates or bulk deletes. Uh, resiliency policies, we'll also look into that. And again, you can use like scoping to allow uh, which services are allowed to speak to uh, which state stores. So here an example, if you want to save some state, some, some key value pair to a state store, of course, uh, your application makes a call to uh, the Dapper sidecar. And in this case, we use the state endpoint, and then you need to uh, specify the component name of the state store. And this is also a label uh, that's referred to in one of the uh, YAML files, which I'll show later. Uh, and then you need to provide like a payload, which is like a key value pair. What is then stored is the, the key is actually like um, composed of um, the prefix is the application ID where the call originated from. So that's why we see orders, then a double pipe symbol, and then the actual key that is part of the payload. 
so this behavior is configurable. Uh, by default, it prefixes it with the application ID, uh, but you can also um, uh, change that behavior uh, to just have the, the key or use like a different, different prefix if you want. If you want to do a get, you use like the, the, the same endpoint, but then you uh, mention the, the actual key that you want to retrieve. So here's an example of uh, the JavaScript SDK if you want to use the uh, state management API. So now we create an instance of the Debra client. Uh, we create an order. Uh, we create a, a state object which has a, a key and a value. And then we use the client.state.save to actually save this state. Uh, and here the, this my state store is the name of the component. And the state is the object that, that, we're, that we're saving. And as you expect, eh, to retrieve it, you need to specify the name of the component again. But here we retrieve it by specifying the key. In this case, the key is the order order ID. Okay, so now it's time for some, some actual, actual demos. Uh, what I have here is like a very small distributed application, two apps, application A, application B. Uh, they talk to each other with service application and application B uh, then uh, saves some state to a uh, local Redis container. Um, and let's run this. And by the way, you, you probably noticed that I'm, I'm doing everything in VS Code. I'm quite fond of VS Code, so I'm also using quite some extensions in VS Code to, to make this all work. Um, I'm using Code Tour. That's one of the extensions I'm, I'm using now to actually um, yeah, give you like a guided tour through your code base and that accepts markdown files. Uh, so that's why I've included all of these slides as, as um, images here. Um, but you can also execute all kinds of commands using Code Tour. Yeah, so I just click this. So I just um, um, yeah, uh, changing, navigating uh, yeah, in my terminal to this building blocks APIs demo. Um, and now I'm navigating to different files in my um, in my project structure. So this is, this sample is in .NET. So uh, I have like two .NET applications. So this is the um, uh, CS project file of application A. It's .NET 8, and there's only one dependency, and that's uh, Dapper uh, ASP.NET Core. Then the program file of that, um, we see some conf configuration that I registered the, the Debra client. So um, um, I, I use that later for the pops up uh, messaging. We'll, we'll get back to that later. Um, and I also register that whenever the HTTP client is, uh, is injected, um, I'm using the Debra client to create me an, a regular .NET HTTP client. But um, here I am actually specifying what the uh, target is that I want to communicate to. And so internally, this will set this uh, Debra um, app ID header. Um, and in this way, um, every HTTP client object that, that I will have an instance from will have this header set. Um, so I will soon call this endpoint slash service invocation. Um, I will provide a payload of uh, social profile details, and then this will be injected, this HTTP client with this header set. And then I'm uh, doing a post to the slash profile endpoint of the other application. And then do a console white line and then get, uh, give back a, a 201 that the um, result is created. So this is the source application. And now let's go to the, to the target application. That's also a .NET 8 uh, app with the same dependency. Nothing really special here. And then this is the program file of that one. Uh, again, we are registering the, the Debra client because now we're using the uh, Debra client to use the state management API. So here we see that I've got, I've got a constant named state store component name, and this has a value of my state store. So, so keep this in mind uh, because uh, this will match up with another value in the actual component file that we'll see soon. So this is the endpoint that uh, will be called by application A, the slash profile. This is the payload, and this gets um, uh, injected, this Debra client, and we're using the save state async method on the Debra client uh, to actually store this. We specify the component name, and uh, this is the key, the ID of the profile details, and then the payload itself, uh, what we're going to store. All right, so and notice this, uh, my, uh, my state store, that's the component name that I've referenced in my application code. But, uh, but as you can see, uh, I'm only using the Debra API here. There's no reference to any uh, state store uh, resource specific uh, uh, code or SDKs here. So I'll now show you uh, a, an example of a component file. So this is a uh, component file that Debra uses, and that has the same uh, label. Right? So this is the my state store label. So whenever the Dapper process uh, starts up, um, Dapper will actually read this configuration 
uh, and whenever uh, the application code um, sees the hidden mice state store, Dapper knows, okay, uh, I see this mice state store label, uh, then I need to use this type of state store. In this case, state.redis. And that has some specific metadata about how to connect to this Redis uh, instance. So uh, there are different, many different um, uh, components regarding state. Uh, and always had this, this last part, it's always like a, uh, the prefix is always the API, so in this case it's state, and then there's a dot, and then there's a specific implementation, uh, in this case it's Redis. I also have one for, for SQLite, uh, that's this, so it's now state.sqlite, uh, but I'm not using this file, I'm using this one. All right, so now let's actually uh, run this, this sample. I'm using uh, the Depper CLI to run both applications. So Depper has a thing that's called uh, Depper Multi-App Run. It's relatively uh, relatively new, um, and you can um, use this uh, depper run dash f and then a dot, and then the dot means um, I, I point to a configuration file uh, that actually um, defines which application I, I, am, I want to run. So that's the file I have open now. It's this depper.yaml file. So it contains, um, 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 I'm pointing to a resources path. It's the resources, and I'm actually in there right now. So this contains uh, several files, uh, some YAML files. I'll get back to this later. Uh, but this is the one that uh, uh, that contains the um, Redis state store configuration. This contains some resiliency configuration, which we'll soon uh, check. The, the, the temp files are ignored, so uh, I'll come back to those. And then there's a list of applications that are configured. So in this case, we have two applications, application A and application B. Um, we have the, both live in different folders and they, we have like different application ports and also different uh, Depper sidecar ports. And there are, and you need to specify how to actually run this application. So in this case, it's .NET. So we use .NET run as the command. Okay, so I'm gonna click this and now, uh, yeah, this, this configuration file will, will be loaded and two applications will be up and running. Uh, the logging is, is quite verbose, um, but that's intentional, especially because later we need to have some insights on how the resiliency is working. So application A and B are now uh, running. And now I have this uh, local.http file. Uh, again, I'm using uh, the, another uh, extension. Uh, it's called the uh, REST client extension. And that allows me to have the, these .http or .rest files, and they can specify variables, and you can uh, specify your endpoints like this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a post to uh, this endpoint, and I'm give, have a yeah, application JSON content type with this payload. You also see this is this sort of a button, this this link here, and whenever I click this, I will do a post uh, call to this endpoint, and the result will show up on the right. So let, let's do this. Okay, I want to get back as a 201 created uh, with the ID um, of uh, this, um, this generated uh, payload. Because this, this is so, sort of a, every time I evoke this, um, um, this, this endpoint, uh, a new GUID gets created for me. That, that's what this, this dollar GUID means. And we see in the logging that application B uh, profile uh, saved to state store um, and application A uh, profile sent to application B. And so we see that the service verification is working and also the, uh, the state management, uh, the state API is working. All right. Uh, let's stop this. Okay, so this is the happy path. I mean, yeah, it's, it's good to see this working, but of course it's, it's a bit boring. Uh, so let's actually, actually have a look at uh, resiliency and let's try to, to, to break some stuff now. Um, so hey, resiliency is built in into the Depper sidecar. So whenever uh, another uh, uh, application cannot be reached, uh, the Depper sidecar will retry uh, that, um, uh, that, that failed uh, request. And there are lots of default policies that Depper uses, but we can actually override or create our own policies. Um, so I'll first uh, show you uh, what the result is, and then we'll have a look at how you can actually configure this. So what we'll do now, we have the same application, we have the same setup, application A, application B, and B will store something in the um, uh, in Redis. Um, but I won't use Depper Multi-App Run now because I will now sort of fake that application B is dead. So we'll start application A only, I'll make the request, I'll wait a couple of seconds, then I start application B, and then we'll see uh, the resiliency in, in place. So I will go into the application A folder, I will run this command which only runs application A. Then I'll create another one and I'll go to application B. So I'll copy the command to 
um, run application B, but I'm not, not running it yet. All right. So now I'm going to make uh, the same request. I'm going to the service invocation endpoint, the same payload. And uh, yeah, let's have a look what, um, what happens here in, in, in the logs. So we don't see a response yet. And in the logs, we see error processing operation endpoint, blah, 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 retrying in two seconds. Yeah, so this is like evidence that the Depper sidecar is uh, doing, doing retries. Um, now let's start application B. So application B is there, and now we get the response back from application A. Right, and we also see in the logs that uh, recovered processing operation endpoint, blah, blah, blah uh, after six attempts. Right. Okay, so uh, resiliency is working. That's pretty cool. All right, well, so now let's show where you can actually um, um, configure that resiliency policy. So there's a resiliency.yaml in this resource uh, file here. Uh, so this is uh, a configuration of kind resiliency uh, there's also a name here but this name is never used in your application it's, it just needs a unique identifier um, now i got like different retry policies here so there's a policy section that contains retries and that section then contains in this case uh, different retry policies i'll get back to this one when we do the state store um, this is the one which is actually being used it's called my constant policy uh, it's a it's a, it is a constant policy. You have either constant or uh, exponential, which is exponential backoff. Uh, so this one just retries every two seconds. And the max retries uh, minus one means I will like retry indefinitely. So this will, this will never stop, uh, which is good for demos, but otherwise uh, probably not, not so useful. Um, some other policies which I'm not using, you can also specify circuit breakers as well and um, then the other part yeah, because if you only do the policy then you have only defined the policy but you have not specified where you want to apply the policy so uh, the next part is targets and here you, uh, here you specify where you want to um, apply this policy to so yeah, you can either apply it to an application or to components so in this case we have apps application b and then we have the retry policy of my constant policy so that's how this is working um, let's move to Another type of resiliency, and that is called uh, outbound component uh, retry policies. So uh, we're not dealing uh, with retries between two Depper sidecars, but we're now dealing with retries from a zipper between a Depper sidecar and another uh, component. So in this case, it's a state store, but it could also be like a, a message broker uh, or another component like a secret store or a configuration store. Uh, so again, there are like uh, default configuration configurations for this. And uh, what you can do, and what I did in this case, you can actually override the, the default. Um, so there is a default policy, uh, which is named default state store component outbound retry policy. It's very, very, very explicit. It is also very clear. Um, but you can actually override that default. Uh, and then again, I use the same uh, configuration as before. It's a constant one. Every two seconds it will retry, and then uh, it will retry indefinitely, which is just practical for, for this demo. Okay, so uh, I'm going to now uh, simulate that the state store is not available. Uh, so I will um, do the same thing again and uh, run both applications using Dapper Multi App Run. So I will run this command again. Uh, so I'll do this first. So application A and application B will be running. Um, but now, since we have a, a Redis running in a container uh, locally, I will stop uh, this, uh, this, this container. Uh, so there's no state store available. Okay, so the state store is, is not there yet. Um, I will also copy the command to start it again, but I won't run it yet. Okay, so now I'm going to do the same thing again. Uh, I'm going to call this service verification endpoint. So uh, application A, application B, that's working, but application B cannot get to the state store. I'm going to make the request. And what we see here is um, error uh, processing operation component my state store and then retrying in two seconds. So again, we see that the uh, default uh, policy is, uh, is, is in place. Um, so now I will start the Docker container again, and now we see that we have a result back. Um, and we also see that, okay, uh, the, it, it's, it has been successful after six attempts. So again, there we see, we see a success of the uh, resiliency policy. All right, let's do the final one of the uh, pops up. All right. 
Okay, so pop swap messaging has so that's like typical asynchronous messaging, right? You have like a, a publisher, you have a message broker, and you have one, one or more uh, subscribers. Uh, it's important to realize that uh, there's a Dapper offers uh, guaranteed at least once delivery, right? So your subscriber should handle potentially uh, more, more messages. Uh, so that's important to know. Uh, there are different ways of, uh, of subscribing to a topic. So I will uh, show uh, a declarative way using YAML files. Um, I think there's an example here of uh, JavaScript that uses a programmatic subscription, so in code. Um, but there's a very new thing in Dapper 114, which is out like a couple of weeks, and you can now use a dynamic subscription. So you can, yeah, so these are like generated at runtime. Uh, so those are like very, very flexible. It's still in alpha, uh, but a lot of people ask for uh, dynamic subscriptions. Um, so this is what happens uh, when you have like a publisher and a subscriber and a message broker, of course, and you use the publish endpoint and then you specify the uh, component name. Yeah? So that's the name in the uh, YAML component. And then you specify the name of the, oh, the name of the topic here. And what happens uh, under the hood is, of course, that um, you'll send your uh, message to the, the Dapper sidecar. The Dapper sidecar will actually uh, wrap your message in a cloud event, um, and it will put it on the message broker. And then the other Dapper sidecar is actually subscribed to that message broker, uh, and the Dapper sidecar will actually forward your message to uh, the uh, subscriber to a specific handler. Um, the nice thing about the cloud event is that that, that actually takes care of uh, that Dapper can do like distributed tracing across message brokers. Um, so this is an uh, example that uses the JavaScript SDK. Um, so the, the publisher uses this, this Dapper client. Uh, we have like a create an order and then we use client.popsup and then .publish. And then the first argument is the component name of the uh, popsup component. The second argument is the topic and then the third is the, is the payload. And on the uh, subscriber side, there's something called then the, the Dapper server. Uh, and there we do server.popsup.subscribe. And again, we mentioned the component name and we mentioned the topic and then a handler function whenever it receives a, uh, a message. And so this is like a programmatic way of doing subscriptions. Uh, but in my demo, I will show a, a declarative way. Um, okay. So um, in the next uh, demo, I will uh, call first, like an HTTP, I make an HTTP call to this uh, slash pops up um, uh, endpoint. Uh, but here we use the Dapper client and that will use the um, uh, a method called publish event async. And in this case, our pops up component is my pops up. Uh, the profiles is the name of the topic and this the, the profile details are is the payload. Okay, now I need to uh, rename some files, which code tool will do for me. Okay. Okay, I have to say goodbye to the code for now, though. Okay, so um, one of the YAML files is popsup.yaml. So this contains the configuration of our popsup component. Yeah? So this my popsup is also what we are referring to in the application code. In this case, it's popsup.redis. And when you install the Dapper CLI, uh, you also get this Redis container. So uh, Redis is our, is our default popsup and state store configuration. So that's why I'm using Redis all the time. And this is then the uh, declarative subscription. Uh, so again, it's a, it's a YAML file, and um, we can see that we are referring to the um, my pops up. So we're referring to the uh, pops up component. We are also using the same uh, topic, of course, uh, and we are pointing that uh, the uh, uh, this this route will be used uh, whenever uh, the Dapper sidecar receives a message. It will be forwarded to this route in our application. And then we also defined a scope. So uh, we, we, we say, okay, yeah, only application B is allowed to subscribe to this, um, to this topic. Okay, so uh, let's run this. We do a Dapper run F again because it's the same two applications. Um, we just use a different way of communicate, communicating with each other. Okay, so application A and B are up and running. So now we use the other endpoint slash pops up because from there we use um, uh, the um, publish uh, event. Uh, so let's call this. And we see uh, that um, communication is done via pops up and we have some, uh, something safe to state again. So that's, uh, that's all working. 
All right. Um, I won't do the resiliency part because it's mostly the same again of like stopping that REST container and starting it again. I, you probably know, uh, know uh, how it works now. It is important to realize that when you're doing pop sub, you actually have like two types of resiliency. You have like outbound resiliency, so that's from the Depper sidecar to the message broker, but you can also configure inbound resiliency, and that's from the Depper sidecar back to the subscribing application. Uh, so you have like yeah, more control over, over resiliency policies here. Um, so I'm not going to run this. Uh, I do want to show you like a couple of things and I probably should show it live. Oh, this is very small. So, so a lot of things are configured via YAML files. Uh, I'm not like a big, big fan of YAML files. Uh, it, it's, it's rather tedious to, to create them. So one of our tools that we created at Diagrid is called uh, Conductor. It has a free version and that contains some, some nice development features to actually help you create these YAML files for components and also resiliency policies. Uh, so if you want to create a, um, a, um, a component for like a pub sub and maybe you're using uh, a Kafka, you can use this wizard type to actually create your component file. So otherwise it's a lot of uh, hunting in the Dapper docs uh, to, to find what's the right schema, what are the right values. So this helps you a bit with creating like um, yeah, proper uh, YAML files for components. Same is true for the resiliency builder. So this will help you build these uh, resiliency configurations uh, much, much easier. All right. Timer is up. Okay. All right. So yeah, I hope I gave you some, some kind of good pointers. What what Dapper is, what Dapper can do for you. Uh, I didn't actually ask. So who, who's actually using Dapper already right now? Who one? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 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 Yeah. That, that's that's great. There. Please please come over in, in a few minutes. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very curious what what you what you think of this uh, slide. So please give me some some, some feedback. Uh, I also got some some Dapper stickers here. So feel free to to collect those. Um, if you want to run the code here or read stuff later, uh, feel free to uh, scan this QR code. This will point to a uh, Git repo in, uh, in Diagrid Labs. Uh, so this, uh, this might be useful. Uh, and um, I've got one more QR code to share after this one. Um, because you've been listening to me so patiently, uh, I would like to thank you. Um, the Dapper project um, um, hands out like digital badges. So they're, they're not NFTs, don't worry. Um, but we have like a whole suite of diff diff different badges and you can just claim this without doing anything. Uh, we also have badges if you write um, a Dapper blog post or, or if, you do, if you contribute to Dapper. Um, but this is like the, the, the entry badge that everyone can claim. So feel free to claim this and share it if you want later on, on socials. Um, thank you everyone. Let me know if there are any questions. Thank you, thank you. The Depper user has a question. All right. First of all, the presentation is The project is fantastic. The presentation is good. But this tool here, it's all about every single thing. Yes. Is there anything that I can find out that shows pretty much all the seven parts that are working? Even with the simplest application, but all the seven parts and you want like a sample application that contains all of the uh, okay 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 we have, because we have like the Dapper quick starts uh, and that contains a repository that has yeah uh, sample applications with all of the uh, individual uh, APIs, uh, but but I do think we don't have one sample where we use all of the APIs in one uh, distributed uh, application. Uh, yeah, okay, fair enough. People also understand that some of them, for example, there's a lot of things that are abstracted here. Right? Yes, yes, so yes. I'm yeah. thinking everything, you, when I have Jagger, for example, yeah. does every communication automatically being traced into Jagger or is it me also that I need to... Sort of I think you need to uh, configure at least, I think, one endpoint hey, of, of your of your hotel uh, uh, endpoints, right? So yeah, another, yeah. Another thing that right now I don't know how to solve properly, apart from having possibly two or three different resources provided at one end of my I have certain needs for development, certain needs for testing, certain needs for yeah. production. How do I? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the component files, right. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was talking with a guy from Flatcard this morning. He gave me some ideas. Okay, okay. Tilo came yesterday, 
I was asking also for a UI, so, and, and the conductor is fantastic. Okay. <laughs> I was asking for a UI yeah. For, yeah. For, 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 because, you know, you're talking about already two levels of abstraction. Yes, right? yeah. Why you yeah. have to manage of every single service, and you got the YML here. So I, I asked for another abstraction. Yeah, and I get it. Now yeah. we have it. And with the flat card, it's another layer of abstraction. Okay, okay, okay. Oof. <laughs> isolate my application on a, I can call it my OS, for example, a massive, massive OS. And I have one infrastructure record that delivers Linux and yeah. my application right. in one IOC. Okay, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, Depper doesn't prescribe any way of uh, changing your component files yes. across different yes. environments, right? So that's op completely up to you. Uh, but yeah, there, there needs well, to be a solution for that. Yeah. I have to have Kubernetes installed on my laptop, or I have to ask, with, with Flatcard, I can yeah. tell them, here is the monolepo, yeah. it gives yeah. you the underlying Linux, and it gives you all my application running on Depper. Okay, okay. Yeah, that that but sounds my nice. The problem yeah. is now how I separate the environment. No, maybe in production I will use Casca, but in development, PubSub is enough to use Reddit. Yeah, 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 I need, yeah, you need a way of uh, yeah, changing these component uh, files in your CI CD system, uh, right? So, yeah, there are different ways of doing that. But but, now yeah. I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm doing and thinking about with different resources files, and when you run the command of Dapper, you tell them if I am in development. Yeah, yeah either local or production. Files. Yeah, 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 that's also a solution. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, from the Depper project, yeah, we, we don't have like a prescribed way how you need to do that because yeah, everyone in CI/CD system is different, right? So it's it's very hard to uh, to to give like one golden rule for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, but you're right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, 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 Depper is needed. This, this, this abstraction layer. Uh, so, yeah. If, if you want to use Depper, yeah, the, then you take a dependency on Depper and no dependency anymore on other like uh, native SDKs of other tools. I mean, yeah. If, if you really have like a strong need of using a specific SDK because yeah, your your application is highly dependent on it. Um, yeah. Then, 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 then there's little use, of course, to use the uh, the Depper pops up. API for that, uh, right? Uh, but yeah, you, you can of course like do mix and match stuff still, right? So you can very easily or as easily you can you can slowly start to integrate Depper in your current system, right? So it's it's, it's not so that you have to uh, apply uh, Depper sidecars to your entire Kubernetes cluster from, from from day one, right? If you want to slowly start, you can just start with one or two services to introduce Depper uh, with that. Um, um, but yeah, the idea of Depper is that you can easily switch between components. Yeah? So so yeah, that that will mean that you probably over time want to reduce the dependency of the external SDKs in favor of the Depper SDKs. But yeah, that that that, that might not be feasible for for uh, some services if you have like really yeah um, really requirements of yeah using very native uh, functionalities of those SDKs. The the only thing uh, that might help is um, so we have these. Uh, APIs and 120 built-in components, you can also create pluggable components. And these are like completely custom components. So, so that th this way you can actually, uh, have, you can actually combine uh, different APIs in such a pluggable component. So if you still have like yeah, very specific SDK requirements, you can host it as a pluggable component, still use the Depper API, and, but since you're using that pluggable component, it's actually still using this specific SDK under the hood, but it is abstracted away. That, that, that might be like an intermediary uh, solution. Right. Yeah. Um, well, it, it is actually so. If 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 you do, for instance, uh, service uh, so you can uh, like um, you you can 
make requests to other services, but still uh, use the uh, build, built in Debra retry policies. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the receiving site doesn't need to have the Debra sidecar, uh, but you can still use the retry policy of, uh, but, but it means that the, uh, the, the originating site that needs to have the Debra sidecar, uh, but, but, but then you still have the resiliency. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so for a certain part, you, you can do that. Yes. Yeah. One of the best features also of this is that you can simplify the service to show it as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. when you do certain things, then where are you going to park? One thing that, in my opinion, needs to be emphasized that Dapper elevated the conversation from how do I run an application to how do I Get a design pattern. Yes, and, yeah, and, yeah. And design patterns in this recruited environment is very, very difficult. We know how yeah. to do it maybe in a living application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In yeah. this recruited environment, design pattern is problematic. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And, yeah. And this is yeah, and we also see like uh, more enriched uh, APIs now, right? So we now have the workflow API, right? Where you can like define tasks and workflows and, and, and also like fan out, fan in. But we also have like the distributed lock uh, as well for a while. Uh, there's like a, the uh, outbox pattern as well now. So probably in the future, there will be more like a bit more higher level uh, abstractions that are built on top of the other uh, Debra APIs. So th that is likely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. M maybe uh, Debra will go in that direction. Uh, yeah, that, that I can't tell. But uh, for for one thing that I know for sure that that's really high on on the list is uh, like also like have like a, a NoSQL API instance, right? Because we have like the, the state management is like only key value, and for a lot of organizations uh, that that's like okay, it's, it's very limited. So they want to like proper querying and stuff like that. So uh, I, I will first see some some more interest in actually providing like a NoSQL API or or like a SQL API itself. So that, that's probably what's going to happen first. Time series would be sufficient. Time series, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, there is a, there is a, there's a proposals issue yeah, because Dapper has a proposal repository. So yeah, if you have like strong opinions about something that, that you really want, or you, you even uh, you want to know what kind of proposals are being made, uh, yeah, definitely have a look at the Dapper proposal because there's one very big proposal about how to uh, create additional uh, state APIs, and I think the time series is also mentioned in that uh, proposal as well. Yeah. Yes. It's really sad that you picked the uh, case for the PubSub resilience. Oh! So, uh, because, <laughs> because the question is so that at the middle, uh, like a message broker, some SaaS can be used, for example, like the Yes, right? yes, yes. So, and then I'm really interested how the uh, sub resilience is realized. So, where this site started and running there? Um, well, yeah. So the, the yeah. Uh, so the, the sidecar is always running next to your application, right? So so so. But but both are of course connected to in this case a SaaS solution of a of, of a topic, uh, for instance. Um, so how then it, can you try something without the topic is not accessible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, well, exactly. If if we maybe uh, go back like a. Bit. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, in, in this case, your message broker is completely gone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so oh, what? No, you published, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but, yeah, it probably, it probably will mean that, uh, well, of course, it depends on when it goes away. But, yeah, but if, if, if uh, this part didn't work, uh, then, then uh, this resiliency pop, uh, policy will, will kick in place. So it will retry. Uh, but, but if, if it has received it, but, uh, um, but, but, um, yeah, but this, this is not in place, then this resiliency pop, uh, policy will be in place. And so then, but in this case, this uh, sidecar runs next. Uh, next this side, yeah, yeah. So, so sidecars are not uh, do not run near the at, at the resources, but uh, but sidecars run in the next to the application. So because this sidecar belongs to this application. Because then you need to switch up those two items, you know, because here it looks like. You know, the container is like next to the message board. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, but this is not one unit. No, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Explain what confuses me. Yeah, okay. Now, this is good to know. This is good feedback. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. Yeah. If there are no more questions, uh, thanks, everyone. Thank good you. questions. Thank thanks.